This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Monday, April 12th. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and most important news from the African continent and around the world. This is today's Africa 54. We begin with two elections that took place in Africa over the weekend. In the West African nation of Benin, vote counting is ongoing on Monday in a presidential poll that was boycotted by some opposition parties over violence triggered by objections to President Patrice Talon's quest for a second five-year mandate. Talon, a multi-millionaire cotton magnate who touts strong economic growth under his leadership, is accused by his opponents of undermining Benin's standing as one of West Africa's most stable democracies. Voter turnout was low compared to previous elections, and there were widespread problems in identifying or registering voters, a group of civil society organizations monitoring the elections said in a statement. They did not provide comparative figures. Protests in several cities last week turned violent. Some people were killed in gunfire on Thursday in the central town of Bante when security forces fired warning shots, according to its mayor. He did not say how many died. Reuters news agency was not immediately able to confirm where or when such violence occurred. Vote counting is also ongoing in Chad after a tense presidential election on Sunday that is likely to see President Idris Deby extend his three-decade rule despite signs of growing discontent over his handling of the nation's oil wealth. Election officials began counting ballots at a polling station in the capital, Jamena, immediately after polls closed. The election commission has until April 25th to announce provisional results. Deby, 68, was the first to cast his ballot at a polling station in the capital, Jamena. He is one of Africa's longest serving leaders and an ally of Western powers in the fight against Islamist militants in West and Central Africa. He seized power in 1990 in an armed rebellion and in 2018 pushed through a new constitution that could let him stay in power until 2033, even as it reinstated term limits. He has relied on a firm grip over state institutions and one of the region's most capable militaries to maintain power. Among Debbie's six rivals is former Prime Minister Albert Pemi Padake, but several leading opponents boycotted the race, including the 2016 runner-up Saleh Kabzebo, who has vowed to make Chad ungovernable if Debbie wins. The coronavirus variant discovered in South Africa may evade the protection provided by Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine to some extent, according to real-world data study in Israel. The study released on Saturday compared almost 400 people who had tested positive for COVID-19 14 days or more after they received one or two doses of the vaccine against the same number of unvaccinated patients with the disease. It matched age and gender, among other characteristics. The researchers cautioned, though, that the study only had a small sam sa sample size of people infected with the South African variant because of its rarity in Israel. They also said the research was not intended to determine any conclusive overall vaccine effectiveness against any variant. Since it only looked at people who had already tested positive for COVID-19, not at overall infection rates, Pfizer declined to comment on the Israeli study. Most in the Midwestern U.S. state of Minnesota are urging worshippers, including people from the East African diaspora, to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Leaders of the faith say receiving a vaccine is a religious duty because it saves lives. Siyad Salah has more in this report narrated by Carol Gunsberg. <laughs> Sharif Mohammed, the Imam of Dar al Hijra Islamic Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, is using his sermon at a midday prayer to try to boost the Somali American community's confidence in the COVID 19 vaccine. In collaboration with medical professionals, the mosque is hosting a vaccination clinic. And we are trying to put the faith and the healthcare 
together. And when the people see and the community see their mosques, the mosques, they come and pray, who also hold a, a vaccine. It's part of a nationwide effort in which religious leaders of all faiths have been enlisted to support vaccination, especially among people of color. The head of the National Institutes of Health made that point at a recent vaccination clinic at the U.S. National Cathedral in Washington. Unfortunately, many who could most benefit because they are at highest risk of serious and even life-threatening infections are still holding back. Houses of worship are houses of hope. In past years, some in the local Somali American community have heeded anti-vaccination messages, including the discredited conspiracy theory that the vaccine against measles, mumps, and rubella caused autism. Religious leaders say they are now trying to fight a new wave of conspiracy theories against COVID vaccine. Sidao Abdi Sharif Mohammed just got his first vaccine shot at the mosque. Oh, this virus is serious. Any Muslim, you need, please, this uh, is a requirement to take this shot. Don't listen all this conspiracy that people are talking about. This is kind of medicine. Islam is not against any medicine. Community organizations involved with this program say immigrants need to protect each other by getting vaccinations. In the immigrant community in particular, we grow up in multi-generational households. And so to protect one another, we must wear our masks like we are today, and we must also get vaccinations. In the United States overall, more than half of all COVID cases and almost half of all the country's 550,000 deaths have been among people of color, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For Syed Sala in Minneapolis, Carol Gunsberg, VOA News. The Biden administration has said it will not be involved in a national vaccine passport system, deferring instead to private companies to implement mechanisms for people to prove they have been vaccinated for travel and other activities. White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara has this report on why vaccine credentialing is a controversial issue in the U.S. Excited fans returning to New York's Yankee Stadium earlier this month for the first time since October 2019 as the new Major League Baseball season begins. They have to prove that they are coronavirus free. Just showing the vaccination card uh, you know, after uh, 14 days is good enough. Otherwise, I know people are getting, um, are getting tested. This week, New York became the first state to offer a digital vaccine passport, a free app and website to prove COVID-free status, either through vaccination or a negative COVID-19 test. We've got to respect people's privacy. Uh, we've got to make sure that the system is accurate. There's definitely more to be worked through. But I think they'll be part of the solution. Private companies around the world already use digital vaccine certification in tourism, entertainment, and other industries. Several countries, including China and Israel, have launched official nationwide systems, but don't expect the U.S. to follow. There will be no centralized universal federal vaccinations database and no federal mandate requiring everyone to obtain a single vaccination credential. Vaccine certification is controversial in the U.S. Some Republican governors have even issued executive orders banning them. Americans are often very skeptical of the idea of anything that might be centralized in the federal government, uh, and they see that kind of centralization as being an affront to either privacy or to freedom. The Biden administration is urging private entities to develop their own solutions, but will provide guidelines to meet certain standards, including accessibility and affordability. The World Health Organization is also against the idea of vaccine passports for travel between countries. We're not certain that at this stage that the vaccine prevents transmission and there are all those other questions, and apart from the question of discrimination against people who are not able to have the vaccine for one reason or another. While certification may help industries eager to jumpstart revenue, health experts say ultimately the answer is to simply vaccinate more people. The more people who are vaccinated, if we really get to over 80 percent, then we don't have to worry about those vaccine passports. Currently, about 20 percent of Americans are fully inoculated. With vaccine hesitancy still a factor, challenges remain for the country to reach herd immunity. Pat Siwida Kuswara, VOA News. Around $1 trillion of food is lost or wasted each year around the world 
according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. VOS Veronica Balderas Iglesias looks at how COVID-19 has powered innovative efforts to prevent food waste and hunger in the United States. Okay. With COVID-19, there has been a tremendous demand for fresh food. Connecting American small farmers directly with their local consumers is one way the nonprofit Fresh Farm is helping reduce food waste during the pandemic. And you're going to end up with a lot less food waste than you do with larger industrial systems because there's much fewer points along the distribution cycle where food can be wasted. And at a smaller scale, planning to prevent waste is somewhat easier. We're very good at keeping balance on our numbers of birds and, you know, we don't really increase until we see a market demand of increasing. Farmers market vendors are encouraged to donate any unsold produce to food banks, which then distribute it. And the need has exploded because of COVID. Whether we have extra or not, I always make sure to bring some boxes to give to those people. Food waste is a huge problem in the U.S., where more than 100 million tons is lost each year. At the same time, the charity Feeding America says 42 million people, or one in eight, may experience food insecurity in 2021. Food rescue programs have turned to the internet to safely manage pickup and sharing operations amid COVID-19 restrictions. They are attracting a wave of volunteers. Innovations are also on the rise. One example, instead of dumping unused food in landfills, where it adds to climate change by releasing methane, a startup, Loop Closing, is putting composting machines where food waste is generated such as restaurants. If you stop hauling food waste and compost it on site, it provides a path to get us from the 6% of recycling of food waste to 100%. And that product of finished compost is put into our soils, which makes our soils more resilient to extreme weather. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is planning to follow United Nations recommendations to measure and set standards for reducing food waste by 50 percent by the year 2030. The rest of the world certainly looks to the U.S. for leadership on climate change. The physical world has limits, and in many cases we're pushing up against them, you know, in terms of the pollution that we generate through our production and consumption choices. But making a serious dent in food waste will take broad collaboration. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says. We're doing um, a lot of consumer education outreach. We're working with private sector stakeholders. Uh, we're spreading the word about the liability protections for businesses who wish to donate food to food banks and pantries. Hello. Michael Rohde is shopping more often at farmers markets in the pandemic. But when it comes to permanently eradicating food waste, he thinks the U.S. will have to fix another problem, the widening gap between poor and rich incomes. Uh, America, in spite of our homeless and hungry problems, is still a rich country. So someone like me, I can come here and essentially buy as much as I want. And that can lead to food waste. And it's hard to see how you could ever actually resolve that issue in a fair manner, an equitable manner. Veronica Valderas Iglesias for VOA News, Washington. Let us know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voafrica.com. Still to come, the world's reaction to the death of Britain's Prince Philip. We'll be right back. is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation.
Welcome back to Africa 54. Tributes have been offered from around the world to Prince Philip, the husband of Britain's Queen Elizabeth, who died Friday at the age of 99. Henry Rijo reports from London. On the gates of Buckingham Palace, a simple message was posted Friday morning. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen has announced the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Within hours, floral tributes began to pile up outside the palace. I think it's a huge loss, um, not only just because he's part of the royal family, but he's a husband, father, you know, he's been there for the Queen through her whole reign. Um, and I think, yeah, the whole, the whole nation will be, will be sad. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson addressed the nation from London. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth and around the world. He was the longest serving consort in history, one of the last surviving people in this country to have served in the Second World War. The first reaction from family members came from Philip's grandson, Prince Harry, and his wife, Meghan, who quit royal duties last year. A short message on their website read, thank you for your service. You will be greatly missed. US President Joe Biden offered this tribute from the White House Friday. Jill and I and the entire administration send our condolences to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on the loss of uh, Prince Philip. Uh, he was a heck of a guy. He, uh, you know, it was uh, his lifetime of service to the United Kingdom and the whole Commonwealth was visible to everybody for a long, long time. And uh, his bravery serving in World War II, as well as his being a champion of the environment, as well as the charity, uh, the charitable things he set up. So uh, we really do express our condolences for extraordinary life that. Uh, by the prince. Former US President Barack Obama and his wife Michelle met the Queen and Prince Philip in 2009. In a statement issued Friday, they said Prince Philip in particular was kind and warm, with a sharp wit and unfailing good humour. We will miss him dearly. In Ottawa, Canada, a member of the Commonwealth, the bell on Parliament Hill rang 99 times, one for each year of Prince Philip's life. Prince Philip will be remembered as a champion for young people, a decorated naval officer, a dedicated philanthropist, and a constant in the life of Queen Elizabeth II. Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, wrote on Twitter, Prince Philip embodied a generation that we will never see again. Residents of Sydney remembered him fondly. Uh, he might not have been the king, but he was the king in so many eyes, I think. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi tweeted he had a distinguished career in the military and was at the forefront of many community service initiatives. May his soul rest in peace. He was a very good gentleman. He has done a very good job for his country also. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan tweeted I convey my deepest condolences on behalf of my country and the Turkish nation. Zimbabwean President Emerson Mnangagwa offered deepest condolences as tributes continue to pour in from dozens of world leaders. In public, Prince Philip was rarely seen away from the Queen's side. Despite his supporting role, he invariably left a deep impression on those he met. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. 23 years after the peace deal was signed in Northern Ireland, there are growing fears of a return to sectarian violence after several consecutive nights of rioting in Belfast. Pro-British Unionist supporters are angry at elements of the Brexit agreement, which they believe jeopardize their place in the United Kingdom. Here again is Henry Rijo from London. A bus was hijacked and set on fire in Belfast Wednesday as protesters hurled gasoline bombs at police. Dozens of officers were injured. Tensions boiled over into violence as pro-British unionist supporters vented their anger. The protests were focused around Shankill Road, 
the long-standing frontier between the mostly Protestant, Unionist and Catholic pro-Irish nationalist communities. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson called for dialogue and leaders of the power-sharing government in Belfast condemned the violence. Just as it was wrong in the past and was never justified, so it is wrong now. That it's only through democratic politics that we can solve our problems and concerns. Those problems are rooted in Britain's exit from the European Union, which made the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland an external frontier of the European Union. It was feared that any hard border here would provoke a return to sectarian violence. So part of the Brexit agreement, called the Northern Ireland Protocol, stipulates that all checks on goods travelling from Britain to Northern Ireland should instead be carried out at ports on either side of the Irish Sea. That has created an effective border between mainland Britain and Northern Ireland, says analyst Katie Hayward. This has led to some sense of um, unease, in particular amongst unionism um, and uh, uh, loyalist communities who feel that Northern Ireland's place in the union is um, under threat. There were widespread predictions that Britain's EU exit could undermine the 1998 so-called Good Friday peace agreement. Brexit tensions have exacerbated sectarian divides between rival parties in the power-sharing government, says Hayward. This is the thing with the peace process. It involves constant uh, negotiation and care and also compromise. And I think there is a bit of a concern that maybe both the UK and the EU felt that they compromised quite a lot on the protocol, and both of them did, no doubt about that. Um, but they also possibly need to come into implementing the protocol with that continued frame, frame of mind. While the police have been the main target of unionist violence, there have been sporadic clashes across sectarian lines. It's all too easy to see how things can get worse. I think that, that's the biggest concern at the moment. US President Joe Biden, who has Irish roots, is concerned over the impact of Brexit on peace in Northern Ireland. We continue to encourage both the European Union and the UK government to prioritize pragmatic uh, solutions to safeguard and advance the hard-won peace in Northern Ireland. Political leaders in Dublin and Brussels have also called for dialogue. The Irish border question dominated Brexit negotiations. And it's clear there are no easy answers. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand has called sexual assault in the military an epidemic. The Pentagon says it is working to tackle the issue, starting with a, an independent review of the problem. Maxim Moskalkov has the story. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin launched an independent review commission on sexual assault in the military to address sexual assault and harassment in the ranks. Ten out of the 13 members of the newly formed panel are women. But critics say such commissions have failed to get results in the past. I think what we'll be asking, what hasn't been tried? What happens in civilian society that is a best practice that we could try on the military side? And then, what are the unique attributes of the military environment that allows us to do things that we can't do on the civilian side? So I think that comparison is very important. In mid-March, U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand chaired a hearing on sexual assault in the military forces. Every general or commander that has come in front of this body for the past 10 years has told us, we've got this, ma'am, we've got this. Well, the truth is, they don't have it. Gillibrand pressed the Senate to move on the Military Justice Improvement Act, legislation she introduced in 2013, but it has stalled since then. Colonel Don Christensen is president of Protect Our Defenders, a group working to end rape and sexual assault in the military. The panel, I think, is uh, a good step forward. It's, uh, I believe, going to be different. The military justice system needs to be changed. Senator Gillibrand's been uh, pushing this legislation since 2013, and it's always had bipartisan support. 
Uh, and so it, it's one of the few pieces of legislation where you would see Elizabeth Warren and Ted Cruz agreeing uh, that something should be done. While in the past the Pentagon has not supported Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's proposal to move commanders out of the process for approving prosecutions in sexual assault cases, Rosenthal said her panel is interested in the proposal because all options are on the table. I think what's different today, quite frankly, is this is not a closed door. The secretary and the president have said all options should be on the table. And that is different today. That is the kind of leadership that we have, frankly, not heard before. Luz Helena Thompson was in the Navy, serving in Japan, when she says she was sexually assaulted. Thompson reported the incident at the time, but did not speak publicly about it until 13 years later, when she met an outspoken activist and survivor of sexual assault in the military, Trina MacDonald. McDonald appeared in 2012 documentary entitled The Invisible War about sexual assault in the military. Defense Secretary Austin wants to see, you know, fresh eyes on this and, you know, and Rosenthal and that basically there's going to be new fresh eyes on stories and this subject. But the unfortunate piece of it is, is this is a story in itself. What we've continued to see is the fact that it's not going anywhere. It's just the very, it's the same rhetoric. The unfortunate piece, I think, is that it's going to bring forth more survivors that have to bear their souls in order to see some more change. But the problem is, is there's a lot of talking and not enough action. And we're hoping that, you know, perhaps this will be the time where the talking stops and the action begins. According to annual Pentagon report, the number of sexual assault cases in the U.S. military in 2019 has increased by 3 percent compared to 2018 and amounted to 7,825. Maxim Moskalkov for VOA News, Washington. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.